So this begins the first of two discussions on the digestive system. This all comes from Chapter 22 in your Martini textbook. Uh, the exam, as you know, will cover lymphatic, respiratory, and digestive systems. And the modules that you'll be skipping over in the Chapter 22 will be uh, 1, 2, 5, 10, 13, 16, and 18. Now those are all modules that cover the anatomy and the histology of the digestive system. So those should be familiar to you. So you definitely want to go back and review those. Additionally, skip altogether 22.6 and 22.7. So those will not be discussed at all. Even if I have the notes in here, they will not be part of the exam. So let's go ahead and, and start discussing the digestive system. Again, focusing on the physiology of this with the anatomy of it already uh, well in your understanding. So again, the digestive system, you know about this. It's, it's taking in nutrients. It's providing uh, nutrition to uh, all sorts of systems and is working quite directly um, with other systems. Uh, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, urinary system, all are also working quite hand in hand with the digestive system. So we can see now this interplay between the digestive system bringing in nutrients, but those nutrients going into the bloodstream, aka cardiovascular system, being sent to the tissues of your body, going to the pulmonary respiratory system for the exchange of gases and going off to the urinary system for the uh, release of waste products. So again, you can see the basic connectiveness between these systems. Now you know that the digestive system is made of the digestive tract. That's the GI tract or all the alimentary canal. These are the structures through which food actually passes from mouth to anus, and then the accessory organs that we'll be discussing, like the salivary glands, the pancreas, the gallbladder, and the uh, uh, liver, those are the accessory organs they contribute to, but food does not pass directly through those structures. So you know the dividing line, if you will, between the digestive organs, the tube-like structures through food which through food through which food travels, and the accessory organs which contribute to the process. And that's where, at the end of this, not today, but likely more to, on the next talk, I'll be going in and talking more about the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So skipping over, you know the four layers of the digestive tract, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. And now the mesentery, that's a new term for you. This is a, a double sheet of peritoneal membrane. So two very thin layers, um, and here this space allows for blood vessels and nerves and lymphatic vessels to travel through this. This mesentery, remember mes means middle, so in the middle of all the organs there's also the stabilizing sheet that helps attach all the organs and also prevents your intestines from entangling on each other. Um, some animals are more uh, prone to colic or to the twisting of the intestines. Humans are pretty, not, not immune to it, but have less twisting of the intestines because of the mesentery membranes. So you can see here the, the layers of the uh, intestine. Those four layers you should know. But also this mesentery, this double layer, which is uh, allowing a, a space for the arteries and veins and for the nerves and lymphatic vessels that are traveling in close proximity to the, t the gut tube. If you look at the mucosa, this should also be familiar to you. This is the lining through which the food is actually traveling, the chyme is traveling, and this is going to uh, begin and end with stratified squamous uh, epithelium. Uh, that is the entire mucosal layer of the digestive system. When you think stratified squamous, you're thinking, of course, oral cavity, and then again at the anus. But in the middle, through the stomach, through the small and large intestines, here you have simple columnar. And on the surface of that simple columnar epithelium, there are villi, or singular villus. These are large finger-like extensions. So you'll see in the drawings, going back, you'll see in the drawings 
all of these little finger-like extensions. Each of those is a villus. Those are not microvilli. Okay, so don't get that confused. Those little branches, those little finger-like extensions coming off here are is a villus. If I could zoom into each villus, I would see that the villus is itself lined with microvilli. So microvilli are on the villi. Okay, little villi, little fingers on the big finger if you want to think about its derivation. The lamina propria is a layer of uh, connective tissue, areolar connective tissue. Again, blood vessels, nerve endings, lymphatic vessels, smooth muscle cells, all of that is down here. Now that's all part of the mucosa. So you've got the mucosa with the finger-like villi and the lamina propria. Deep to that, you have a layer of muscle within the mucosa. This is a separate layer. So the muscularis mucosa, here you have two layers of muscle, inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer, and together those two layers can really do a lot of rhythmic dancing for the peristalsis necessary to keep the food moving through the alimentary canal. There are also some nerve plexuses here. You have more nerve endings in your gut than in any other organ of your body. And those nerve plexuses are going to be controlling, from a nervous system standpoint, the control of digestive activities. You know that the parasympathetic nervous system is going to increase digestive muscle tone, bring more activity, digestive processes to the digestive system. And sympathetic stimulation, you know, will decrease that same activity. And so there's a series of submucosal plexuses which are traveling uh, in the submucosal layer and are innervating both the mucosa and the submucosal layer. Again, lots of nerve endings in your gut. There's two different plexuses, the myenteric plexus. Myo, something to do with muscle. So this is going to be located in the muscularis externa, the outer layer of muscle and between the circular and between the longitudinal layer. So it's right in between the muscle layers. So the myoenteric plexus is in the muscle layers. And this is going to help control the activity of digestive activity. So looking at this image and trying to get a sense of this, this is now we're blowing up. You are looking at the mucosa. The mucosa is all of those cells along the villus. So this is the villus. So all of that is going to be the epithelial layer with the villi. The lamina propria is right below it. The submucosa, right, uh, below all that, and then the muscularis externa, or what I would have called in 105, just simply the muscularis, which is a double layer of smooth muscle. And then, of course, the outer layer, the serosa. Now you know that the gut is lined by smooth muscle, and that smooth muscle is going to be found uh, in a couple of different arrangements. Number one, it's going to be around the, the gut organs, helping to push the products. It's also going to be around blood vessels that's regulating blood flow, and we're going to find some sphincters along the way that are going to help regulate the movement of chyme and food-like substances through the digestive system. So there are a lot of sphincters and muscle layers, and when you think about the digestive system, except for the stomach, there are going to be two layers of muscle. Again, a circular layer that's on the inside, that's going to be more sphincter-like, more squeezing, and then the outer layer is more longitudinal, so it's going uh, along the long axis of the vessels. If we take a look at a higher magnification of the two layers of the muscle, you would see here a distinction in the layers, and this these cells are going this way. They're going left to right, longitudinal, along the length of the vessel, along the length of the tube, and then there are cells that are going in and out of the board, if you will, in and out of this picture. So these cells are going deep to superficial, and they're creating that circular layer. So these smooth muscle cells, you know about smooth muscle cells, they are um, fusiform in shape, 
They have a single nucleus. They have a little bit of actin. They have actinomycin in them, but the actinomycin is arranged differently than it is in either skeletal or cardiac muscle. Remember, there's no T tubules, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is more loosely arranged through smooth muscle than it is in uh, cardiac or uh, skeletal muscle. There are no sarcomere-like structures, and because there's no sarcomere, there is no overlapping myosin and actin in the way that we see striations. So recall that smooth muscle is a non-striated muscle. There's also the thin filaments, the actin molecules, are attached to dense bodies. And these dense bodies are these dense bodies are distributed throughout the sarcoplasm. And they're similar to the Z lines, similar to the Z discs that we saw in skeletal muscle. And they're going to be a point of attachment for these smooth muscle cells. Thick filaments are also scattered throughout the sarcoplasm. Uh, the thin and thick filaments still interact with each other, and there's still a contraction. But rather than the entire muscle lengthening from one end to the other, it's more like the cell kind of twists like a corkscrew and kind of puckers up. So it shortens, but not in a straight way like myofibrils did in striated muscle. So a smooth muscle cell, when it contracts, does more of a puckering. So it does shorten, it does get smaller, but it kind of puckers up and twists rather than just in a long linear way like you imagine uh, skeletal or cardiac muscle shortening. Again, the dense bodies are these little sections where you see the filaments attaching with each other, and then when they contract, everything kind of puckers up. Now, another thing about smooth muscle Smooth muscle is innervated in motor units like skeletal muscle. Remember that uh, one neuron and all of the muscle fibers to which it attaches is the definition of a motor unit. Here, however, each cell can be connected to more than one motor unit, or motor neuron, sorry. That's different. In the skeletal system, any fiber, any muscle cell was only going to be connected to one and only one axon terminus. So here, we have a little bit of a different thing. So you have some multi-unit smooth muscle cells, and the iris, the male reproductive system, the walls of large arteries, the erector pili muscles of the skin are all these multi-unit smooth muscle cells so that you can have more than one motor unit, motor neuron going to it. Then there's visceral smooth muscle cells, and these have no direct connection with motor neurons at all. These are arranged more in layers, and these are going to have, oftentimes, gap junctions that allow for electrical connections. So this is going to allow the smooth muscle to contract as a single unit. This should sound really similar to what the syncytial arrangement is in the heart. So here, all the cells in these layered, like visceral smooth muscle cells, all the cells will contract as a single unit. Again, we might call that a syncytium. Okay, and this is happening because there's pacemaker cells. So just like the heart had pacemaker cells in the SA node or the AV node, there are also some rhythmically stimulating pacemaker cells located along the digestive tract. And what those cells are going to do is set a peristaltic wave. There's going to be movement through the digestive system on a regular timing pacemaker going through not only the digestive tract, but also the gallbladder, the release of bile, the urinary bladder for the emptying of the bladder, and many other organs also share this sort of arrangement. So here we see multi-unit smooth muscle on the left, and this is, for example, seen uh, in, the, in the eye, and you see that here's one, here's one axon. And these axons are not only, like when we think about an axon, you think about a cell going down, and then there are little axon terminals at the end. Right? In the neurons that go to the smooth muscle, there are these little areas of swelling. So you can see that one neuron coming down can have like a little synaptic knob here, a little synaptic knob here, and a little synaptic knob here. Those are called varicosities. And have you ever heard of varicose veins? So it's the same idea. Varicose veins are vessels that have kind of 
uh, have these areas of swollenness, if you will, and here neurotransmitters can be released along the way. So what we see is that one muscle cell, here's a muscle cell, that muscle cell has interaction with not just one, but multiple neurons. So that's the multi-unit smooth muscle, found for example in the eye. Most of the gut is going to have visceral smooth muscle, and what we see now is that all of these smooth muscles do not have direct connection with the neuron. Instead, it's nearby, and when one cell is stimulated, all of the cells are rapidly stimulated because there are gap junctions, and these again are electrical synapses. So just like when you think about the heart and you think about the electrical synapses going through intercalated discs, it's the same sort of idea with smooth muscle of the gut. Another thing about smooth muscle, it has tremendous plasticity. It has a lot of ability to adapt. Just like um, when you, when you uh, eat more and your stomach stretches, or when you eat more and there's more food in your intestines, the, the stretchiness of the smooth muscle allows for your digestive organs to distend. And this is important. Uh, the digestive tract organs change shape and size more than most other muscles. And so it's important that there is a ability to stretch. And um, there's a normal amount of background. That would be called the tone. So there's a plasticity, a stretchability, if you will, an, an adaptability of the smooth muscle along the gut. And there's also smooth muscle tone. That is a normal amount of activity in the background that is keeping things moving through the system. Peristalsis, that rhythmic-like wave, pushing things through. Again, those two layers of muscles are working together to create this rhythmic dance. So you can see that idea here. Here's a bolus of food, a ball of food, and it's traveling. And you can see how the two different layers of muscle will contract, and as a result, do this rhythmic dance, pushing the food through the chyme, through the digestive system. There's also segmentation. Segmentation is a different type of, of churning of the digestive system, and this is going to allow uh, fragments of the bolus, chunks of that ball of food, to be mixed with the intestinal secretions. So basically what happens, in no particular set pattern, there will be small areas of the intestine that will sort of portion themselves off and will allow now the segmentation. So as the name suggests, so you see that more and more of the more and more of the wall is walling off and creating smaller and smaller sections. And so that walling off is then going to allow the, the digestive enzymes to churn and really mix those regions up. So now you've got the chyme being broken down more completely. Now what is it that's regulating the movement of the digestive process? So there are some local factors. Local factors are pretty much going to be uh, changes in pH. So as the food is going through the gut, of course the stomach is creating acid and there's going to be some pH changes along the lumen of the intestinal tract. We're going to see how the pH can change the digestive activity. There's also going to be distortion, stretching, uh, distension of the uh, vessels, and also some chemicals, some uh, nutrients or chemical messengers released by the mucosal layers themselves can, on a local level, induce changes in the digestive system. That is to say, if it's local, it's not hormonal and it's not nervous system. So local means that there's something happening at the local environment. It's not coming in from the systemic system. It's not coming in from the nervous system or from the endocrine system. Now, in addition to that, there are neural control mechanisms. And here we get into those reflexes and to those uh, plexuses. There's a myenteric reflex. This is considered a short reflex. And the myenteric reflex is triggered by chemo receptors or stretch receptors along the way. So you have, this is triggered by chemoreceptors. So 
or stretch receptor. So along the digestive wall, if there's a stretching going on, that stretching will activate some neurons in this myenteric plexus, and that will then cause a reflex, a contraction of the muscle. Now there's also longer reflexes. These are higher level control. These are going to be more involved with the central nervous system, and this is going to be pushing in a larger scale peristalsis and pushing larger molecules through. Now remember that rest and digest is not exclusively, but is largely a parasympathetic thing. So if you have, if you're in the rest and digest mode, and uh, that is the driving force, then there'll be more activity going to the muscles of the digestive system, and that'd be a nervous system control. And then finally, there is a whole bunch of hormones that are affecting digestive function. We'll talk about some of them. And honestly, this is still an extremely hot area of research when scientists are trying to figure out what are the hormonal signals of digestion. So this number is increasing all the time, and we're finding that um, this is a very complex interaction of hormones along with your nervous system and along with local regula regulation. The hormones are produced by endocrine cells along the lining of the digestive tract. These are the enteroendocrine cells. But in addition to this, you have other hormones that are released into the blood and are affecting the digestive system as well. So what we have then, if we just look at a cross-section, there is definitely local factors. There are the pH changes and stretch changes uh, in the gut itself. And then there are neural connections where you have both short and long reflexes. This is going to be involved with the peristalsis and the segmentation. And then finally, there's lots of um, secretion of hormones, not only by the enteroendocrine cells along the digestive tract, but also other hormones that are released from the pancreas, for example, insulin and glucagon and other hormones that you've heard of that are involved with digestive processes. So five we're skipping over because five is something that, and these are just the other terms, five is just looking at the, just the major organs of the digestive tract. So please go back and review the basic structures there. And then six and seven, I told you we we're skipping all together, so those are not even in the notes. Number eight, you know that the pharynx is divided into three parts. This is a review. There's the nasal, the oro, and the laryngopharynx. And those three regions should be very familiar to you. Again, there are different areas. Nasal pharynx in the back of the nasal, nasal, the nasal pharynx, back of the nasal passages, oral pharynx, back of the oral cavity, and then together, uh, they both merge down into the laryngopharynx, um, which is now going to head continuing down into the esophagus. So read about the esophagus, and there are sphincters. Now, in 105, I introduced the lower esophageal sphincter, otherwise known as the cardiac sphincter. Remember, too, that uh, the Ammerman book also referred to that as the gastroesophageal sphincter. So those are all one in the same sphincter. There is also a upper esophageal sphincter that I never introduced before. This is the band of smooth muscle that prevents air from entering into the esophagus. So you know there's the epiglottis, and the epiglottis prevents food from going down the glottis and the larynx. Likewise, there's this band of, of smooth muscle that prevents air from going down into the esophagus. That is the upper esophageal sphincter. The layers of the esophagus, review that. Remember, this is stratified squamous. And I would like you to know a little bit about the physiology or the stages of swallowing. So swallowing starts off as voluntary, right? We choose to put food in our mouth. We choose to chew that food. We choose to make that bolus. And we usually choose to begin the swallowing process. But once we begin swallowing, it, sw it, it quickly turns into an involuntary or a reflexive process. So we start with the voluntary phase. This is the buccal phase. This is where you're making the bolus, you're using your tongue, you're using the voluntary muscles of the soft palate. And as you begin to push that food back, at that point, the soft palate the uvula will rise, that's going to block off the nasopharynx, 
and food is going to start entering down deeper into the oropharynx, and this is going to trigger the pharyngeal phase. Now, this is going to be stimulated by the touch receptors, the tactile receptors found in the uvula and the palatine arches, and now we're switching from voluntary to involuntary. So this is now going to be controlled by a part of your brainstem from the medulla oblongata, referred to as the swallowing center, and this is going to coordinate those muscles of the larynx, the epiglottis, the uvula. Some of those things are out of your complete control. Now, in the third phase, you're in the esophageal phase, and now you're definitely way beyond any kind of voluntary control. The bolus is being forced through that upper sphincter down into the esophagus. It's pushing down through peristalsis, and as it almost gets down to the lower esophageal sphincter, that sphincter will open. And typically, the travel time from oral cavity from, from the beginning to the end of the esophagus is about nine seconds. Liquids, of course, are being faster. If you have something that's dry that you swallow, you can kind of feel it getting stuck in your esophagus. Clearly, that would take longer. Or if for some reason your esophagus is not well lubricated, then it will take a little bit longer, and it may require a second wave-like constriction to get that food down to the stomach. So this just goes through the three phases of swallowing, buccal, pharyngeal, and esophageal. So also relatively new, I mentioned the mesenteries, these double membrane layers that are closing. Uh, you have the peritoneal cavity. And this is going to enclose the stomach and most of the intestines. This is, of course, the serous membrane. You have the visceral and the parietal layer. You know that. The serous membrane is going to be continuous, um, continuously secreting peritoneal fluid. This is going to keep all of your organs sliding over each other nice. About seven liters a day, amazingly, is made and reabsorbed within your gut. Clearly, if you didn't reabsorb it, you'd be taking it, you'd be building a fluid in your gut. So this is released and then reabsorbed in a continual regulated way. At any one point, you get about 50 mils of fluid floating in those layers, but seven liters made out throughout the day. If there is uh, too much of this, uh, if you have a liver disease, it can actually accelerate the fluid production, or if you have kidney disease or heart disease, and now you'll see an accumulation of this peritoneal fluid, uh, which is called ascites. So ascites is, is abdominal swelling. This is the same sort of abnormal swelling you see with uh, children in developing countries where they're not getting enough protein, and you know enough about that. If you're not making enough protein in your body, you're not getting enough protein in your diet, that means you're not making enough albumin. Your liver is not making enough of the, of the blood proteins. If there's insufficient levels of blood proteins, there would now be insufficient oncotic pressure. And so at the capillaries, water would not, not be adequately drawn back into the capillaries, leading to more interstitial fluid and the accumulation of this fluid around the abdominal cavity so you'd have big tummies on these starving kids. There are also dorsal and ventral mesenteries that are formed during embryo embryological development, and these are going to be suspending the, the digestive tracts and the accessory organs in the body, and those are simply referred to as the mesentery. So one of these, there's a couple of them that have names that I want you to know. One is the greater omentum. Omentum comes from the word meaning fat. It's a big layer of connective tissue, like a fat-filled pouch, and it comes over the body wall, and will cover most of the small intestine. It provides another layer of padding and protection. Then there's the mesentery itself, and then there's a the mesocolon, and this is going to connect the large intestine to the body wall. So think meso, me the mesentery, connected to the colon, the large intestine. There's also a lesser omentum from the ventral mesentery. We get the lesser omentum. This is going to connect the liver to the stomach or the stomach to the liver. There's also a place here for blood vessels to travel. And there's also a falciform ligament here. And this is a ligament that you'll see in drawings that is going to connect the liver to the anterior body wall. So if we're taking a slice through the abdominal pelvic cavity, you would note, just to get your bearings here, here is the little old stomach. Here is, sorry, that's the pancreas. Here's the stomach here, and the stomach is attached, 
has around it the lesser and greater omentum, and here is that falciform ligament attaching the, lig the liver to the anterior wall. Looking at it from a different view, there's the falciform ligament, liver to the intestinal wall. Coming down, stomach, the greater omentum goes around the front of the stomach as well as around the front of the intestines. The lesser omentum is back behind the stomach between that and the liver. Now, as the uh, digestive tract is changing, the mesenteries will also change and some of the tracts will eventually become fixed and fused together. And so um, this is during development. There'll be some of this changing with the mesenteries, but eventually everything becomes sort of fixed and becomes connected and fused together within your body. So if we take a look then at the adult, here's the stomach. We see the greater omentum has been cut from this view. The mesocolon here and you can also see the lesser omentum here, back behind the liver, be over here, liver and stomach side. And then the mesocolon will be fused to the dorsal body wall. So we'll see that layer gets fused to the back wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity. From the side, this is the view we don't see very often, but of course you have the parietal peritoneum lining the gut, most of the gut, going around the stomach, going around most of the liver. Okay, But then we see that the pancreas and the kidneys right, and other organs are retroperitoneal. So the pancreas is back behind the peritoneum. A part even of the duodenum also is back behind the peritoneum. The greater omentum is this big flap going across the front. The, the lesser momentum would be back between the liver and the stomach. We'll skip over 10. This is just talking about the structure of the stomach itself, the regions, the fundus, the cardia, the body, the pylorus. That's a review. Looking at the parts of the stomach, looking at it in anatomic position. And the stomach has not two layers of muscle, but instead three. So there is an oblique layer in addition to the circular and the longitudinal layer. This is really going to strengthen the stomach wall as well as allow it to really mix and churn with the chyme uh, and the digestive enzymes. Along the way, there are the rugae, the wrinkles, and these deep folds along the mucosa that's going to increase the surface area. And there's an, an antrum, and that is a cavity. So as we move toward the pylorus, there's a cavity, sort of an enlarged area, along with the canal itself into which we end up at the sphincter. So chyme is going to be leaving here. So we go through, we come in, the cardiac sphincter, the cardiac region, the fundus, the body, three layers of muscle, the rugae. This would be the antrum, the opening area, the actual pyloric canal before getting to the pyloric sphincter. Once you're past the pyloric sphincter, you're now in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. So the stomach, we know it's going to store the food for a short while. It's going to break down that food. It's going to disrupt chemical bonds through acid and enzymes. And one more thing, that the stomach is making a protein called the intrinsic factor. And we'll see that intrinsic factor is important for vitamin B12 to be broken down and, and absorbed into the body. And this is the only place in the body where this stuff is made, intrinsic factor, important for B12 absorption. So layers of the wall very of the stomach, very similar. There's a mucosa, there's a submucosa, there's a muscularis, and a serosa. You're not surprised by that. These cells have a short-lived three to seven days because they are being replaced constantly. They're being broken down by that highly acidic environment as well as the physical, mechanical digestion that's occurring. So as you look at the stomach, all of the rugae, all those gastric pits, all of that is lined by epithelial cells, so there's your mucosa. Below it, blood vessels in the submucosa, then the three layers of the muscle, the muscularis, and then, of course, the serosa. There are deep 
in the stomach some gastric glands. These glands are going to be producing um, the acid and the enzymes that break down the food. And there are two kinds of cells here I want you to know about. One, parietal cells. Now we've seen that word parietal. It's, a, it's an odd word, isn't it? We have a parietal lobe in the brain. We have a parietal bone on the, on the cranium. We have uh, the parietal layer of the serous membranes. And now we're seeing parietal cells. So parietal is one of those words that is all over the place. And there's also chief cells. Now together, these two kinds of cells are secreting the gastric juices. And you are making about one and a half liters of gastric juice each day. There's also glands in the pylorus that are secreting mucus and hormones that are going to help coordinate the entire digestive process. Now, down in those gastric pits where you see the rugae, this is where we're going to find those cells that are being sloughed off, but also where these gastric glands are making the acid. So in those gastric pits, there are, or the gastric glands, there are parietal cells the parietal cells are the cells making the intrinsic factor, again, involved with B12 absorption, and these are the cells making the hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, right, this is the same stuff you've used maybe in a chemistry lab. Hydrochloric acid, very strong acid, very low pH. It's going to keep the pH of the stomach roughly down about 1.5 to 2, very acidic. This HCl is also going to activate pepsinogen. Now, you've seen this story before. Remember, just as a side, but a similar story, you've seen fibrinogen. Fibrinogen was a molecule floating in your blood, and when activated, you got rid of the OGN part, and you made fibrin. And fibrin was the part of the, uh, the protein that helped make the blood clot. Same story. In your gut, you have a protein called pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is going to be cleaved to the active form. Fibrinogen was cleaved to fibrin. Pepsinogen will be cleaved to pepsin. Okay. And we see the word Pepsi in there. Uh, Pepsi was, when it was first uh, made, was made by a pharmacist. And it was made to be helping to cure stomach ailments. So Pepsi, uh, pepsin, you see the connection. There's also G cells down here. These G cells are producing, these are some of those enteroendocrine cells. They're producing a variety of hormones within the stomach itself. Then those chief cells, they are secreting pepsinogen. So the chief cells made the pepsinogen, and the HCL released by the parietal cells cleaves that pepsinogen into pepsin. Pepsin is the major protein digesting enzyme released in your stomach. There are also other enzymes that are released that are important for the digestion of milk in the infant that are less important in you and me. So as we look at the surface of the stomach, we see those rugae. What those rugae are, though, is deep pits. And those gastric pits go down, and they split. And along these mucosal layers, there are chief cells, G cells, and parietal cells. I'm not going to ask you to know them by vision. It's hard to tell which one is which. But I do want you to know what the parietal cells are doing, what the G cells are doing, and what the chief cells are doing in these gastric pits. The HCL, the parietal cells do not create HCL in their own cytoplasm. If they made HCL inside of themselves, it would destroy the cells. It would be too acidic. So in fact, what happens is that hydrogen, H+, and Cl- are transported and secreted separately into the gut, and then the HCL acid, the hydrochloric acid, is created. So we have to deal with these two things separately. So the hydrogen is generated by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. That's going to convert CO2 and water into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will give us this H+. And then we also have to get the Cl-, and the Cl- is going to come from bicarb. So bicarbonate HCO3 minus bicarbonate is going to be ejected into the interstitial fluid in exchange for chloride. That chloride comes in, and that is now going to mix with the hydrogen to make the hydrochloric acid. So down in the gastric pits, now we have hydrogen, we have chloride, and that together is going to make the HCl. 
So looking at the general story, here is the lumen of the gastric gland. And we have, again, hydrogen being released and chloride being released separately into the lumen to make HCL. The HCL is not being produced inside the cell, otherwise it would kill it. Where's that chlorine coming from? The chlorine is coming from the interstitial fluid and it's being exchanged for bicarb, HCO3 minus. Moving along, section 12, um, to increase the absorption of nutrients, there must be an increase in surface area. And so there are these folds, lots of folds along the intestine. And these are permanent features, lots and lots of these folds in the um, duodenum and also in the jejunum. And I've already mentioned these villus. Each, each villi is a finger-like projection of the mucosa and... This is increasing the surface area. Now, covered on these villi would be microvilli. Okay, so there'd be microvilli on the villi. And together, this is going to give an incredible increase in surface area. And that increase in surface area is going to make it more easy for the digestive system to absorb amino acids and water and other molecules coming through the gut. There are also intestinal glands called the Crypsa Libricun, and these are located at the base of the villi, and these are stem cells. So these cells actively divide at the base of the glands and will replace these cells that are shed. So this is, you know, these cells are basically your stem cells that are constantly replacing the cells of the gut. So again, all these finger-like structures are villi, and we don't see it here, but each villus itself is loaded with microvilli, and on top of the villi, there are circular folds. So you've got these folds with villi on which there are microvilli, and again, collectively, this is giving you a 600-fold increase in surface area so that nutrients can be absorbed while traveling through that 18 feet or so of small intestine. Now, I mentioned to you in 105, and I mentioned to you also we were describing the, the lymphatic system, that there is a lot of blood vessels traveling along your gut, but there's also uh, capillaries uh, picking up nutrients and lacteals. And lacteals, think lactate, lactose, uh, these are capillary, lymphatic capillaries, and there are molecules that do not directly enter into your blood capillaries, but instead enter into the lacteals. And your fatty acids, many of your fats, are too large to directly get into the bloodstream. And so they go through that lacteals. They're transported through the lymphatic system. And as you know, those lacteals would travel through the lymph nodes and back and eventually drain into the venous circulation as those thoracic ducts and, and uh, lymphatic ducts drain back into the left and right subclavian veins. On the surface of these lacteals, uh, there are some movement. Uh, this is going to help move the intestinal contents. And then on the very surface, you have those microvilli. And that microvilli layer, or that carpet of microvilli, is oftentimes referred to as the brush border. Yes, it's increasing the absorption rate and the surface area, but there are also a lot of enzymes located right at the brush border, and these enzymes are going to help break down molecules and allow their absorption into the epithelial cells. So if we take a look then, here is a just a chunk of an intestinal tract. Here is a lacteal. So lacteal, notice that this looks much like a villus, right? And in the middle we see green. So now we see all this green, and that's your lacteal. So again, molecules move in, and the larger fat molecules are absorbed into the lacteal, while the smaller molecules, uh, amino acids and whatnot, would be directly absorbed into the intestines, into the, into the uh, veins. Section 13 is just the sections of the small intestine, so please review those sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. 
The duodenum uh, acts as a mixing bowl because remember the duodenum is not only the first part of the small intestine and it's receiving the chyme from the stomach, but it's also receiving the digestive secretions from the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas. And uh, this is the segment coming out of the stomach. Think about it, this would be a very acidic area because of all that stomach acid, but the pancreas is releasing a lot of bicarbonate, which basically neutralizes this acidic chyme. So there are some duodenal glands and pancreatic secretions, which are going to um, neutralize the acid. And once we get here, we'll see that there are, are uh, has a, there's a few folds here and a few villi. But here we're really into mixing everything and neutralizing it. And then we're going to see the jejunum is pretty much that long segment out in the middle where you are primarily having lots of these folds, lots of long villi, and most of your chemical digestion and chemical absorption is going to happen here in the jejunum. And so people having gastric bypass surgery, sometimes in the Ruin Weiss procedure, they'll cut out the jejunum altogether, and they'll bypass that and connect now the ileum, the last part, up to the duodenum, and even bypass the duodenum and bring it right up into the stomach. And so by doing so, they're decreasing the absorptive length and the absorption of nutrients. The ileum is the final segment of the small intestine. It's the last three and a half meters or so. It's going to end at the ileocecal valve, as you know. And very few folds, very few villi, very short, stumpy villi, because basically, by the time we get to the ileum, we've absorbed all the nutrients. And now we're preparing for entry into the colon. So if you just note the histology here, you can really see all those circular folds in the jejunum, and also some of those folds within the ileum. Not as many here, but remember too that it's here in this area that the duodenum is receiving the secretions of the gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas, and the duodenal glands. And so this isn't in the duodenum as much about surface area as it is just mixing the chyme and these neutralizing enzymes. Now, section 14, we're going to get into the hormone regulation of the digestive system. There are five major hormones that are going to regulate the digestive activities. Four of them are produced by the duodenum themselves. And the duodenum is going to coordinate all of this gastric activity and all these secretions according to the timing and the arrival of the chyme from the stomach. The first hormone is gastrin. It is produced by those G cells that I mentioned were along the stomach and the enteroendocrine cells of the duodenum. So G cells make gastrin. That's easy enough. And gastrin is stimulated by food presence in the stomach in the duodenum. So as you eat, as food is pushed into the duodenum, it is going to increase gastrin, especially if there's a high protein content. This is going to increase your stomach mobility, increase your gastric acids, increase your enzymes. So gastrin is going to be an important enzyme to get the digestive system really rocking. The second one is secretin. Secretin is also uh, released by the duodenum upon arrival of chyme. So it's that acid that activates secretin. And it's going to increase the secretion of bile from the liver and buffers from the pancreas. So it makes sense that if you just received a bolus of chyme into the duodenum, that low pH is going to activate the release of the neutralizing enzymes from the liver and the pancreas. This is also going to decrease gastric mobility and secretory rate. So we're going to see a lot of yin-yang going on here with these hormones. The third hormone is GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide. This is also released by the duodenum when fats and carbs, especially glucose, enter the small intestine. It's going to inhibit gastric activity. It's going to increase insulin secretion or release from the pancreatic islets. So it makes sense, more sugar, more, more insulin. And secondary to this, it is going to stimulate lipid synthesis in adipose and increase glucose by skeletal muscles. So look at this connection. A lot of glucose is actually going to stimulate lipid synthesis. Yikes, that doesn't sound good. So the next time you're drinking a Coke, think, okay, not only are you getting the sugar and the caffeine, but you're also upregulating your GIP which is also stimulating lipid synthesis in adipose. And I don't know about you, but I don't need any more lipid in my adipose. 
Number four, CCK, uh, cholecystokinin. And this is also secreted by the endo- uh, duodenum when chyme arrives, especially when there's a lot of lipids and, and partially digested proteins. This is going to increase enzymes from the pancreas involved with breakdown of those lipids and proteins and cause contraction of the gallbladder. Remember, the gallbladder is storing bile. Bile is going to help emulsify or break down fats. So as fats enter the duodenum, you're going to create, you're going to release CCK. CCK is then going to tell the gallbladder to squeeze and release some of that bile. This is also going to inhibit gastric activity and may reduce hunger sensations. So this is why people who ate high-protein diets, Atkins kind of diets, if you have a diet high in fats and high in protein, we know that it could reduce hunger sensations. So people who ate blue cheese and cheese and hamburger all day uh, weren't that hungry, in part because the CCK was being released. The fifth and final hormone that I want you to know about is um, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP, also released by the, by the duodenum, stimulated, it stimulates the secretion of intestinal glands. It's going to dilate the regional capillaries to absorb more nutrients and, himit, and, and inhibit sorry, acid production in the stomach. So definitely review these five different hormones and what they are doing. Gastrin was the only one made in the stomach. The other four were all made in the duodenum. And look at how they would regulate uh, or be released. Uh, Are they turned on by lipids? Are they turned on by glucose? Are they turned on by amino acids? And keep that story straight. And then I'm going to finish up with this section today. And this is uh, the central and local coordination of the digestive Activity. So we talked about the three phases of the swallowing. Now there's stages of the gastric secretions. And this is all about the location of the control center. So there's first the cephalic phase, right? In your head, you see, you smell, you taste, you think of food. This is going to be directed by your central nervous system. This is also going to increase gastric secretions. You're preparing your stomach for that food. You're also going to, through your central nervous system, send parasympathetic signals down your vagus nerve to increase your gastric gland secretion. You're going to start making more uh, secretions. And this lasts only a few minutes. So you're thinking about a meal, and if it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, you'll kind of go away. But this is the cephalic phase. Followed by the gastric phase. At this point, you're you're bringing food into your body. It's going down to your stomach. Your stomach is going to distend. It's going to increase the uh, gastric secretions, increase the uh, stomach acids, And now, those undigestive materials, especially proteins and peptides, are going to cause your stomach to make gastrin. Gastrin is going to cause your stomach to start going through waves, mixing all that, making more HCL from the parietal cells, making more pepsin from the chief cells, and this can go on for three or four hours. You're mixing and breaking down by acid, and gastrin was involved here. So you think about bringing in food, see it, smell it, think of it, starts a signal down to the gut through the vagus nerve, and then also once you do put food down, now you're going to start activating those mucus cells, those chief cells, the parietal cells, and the gastrin as you have food in the gut. Thirdly, there's the intestinal phase. You've now made chyme. That chyme is now entering the duodenum, and it's been mixing for a few hours in the stomach. You're going to push that food through the... the, um, Uh, pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. This is now going to initiate what is referred to as the enterogastric reflex. This is going to inhibit gastrin. Gastrin was turned on when it was in the stomach. It's going to inhibit gastrin as it goes down into the duodenum. It's going to decrease gastric mobility and secretion because now what do we want to do? Now we want to not worry about gastric motility, but now we want to start focusing on the contraction throughout the intestine. We're also going to make some more mucus so that we can carry this chyme and these food particles through the intestine nice and smooth. So again, as we get down uh, into the duodenum, we go into the intestinal phase, and here, if you have lipids or proteins or carbs or low acid, you're going to turn on the CCK, the GIP, and the secretin, and those are all going to help with the digestive process. 
There are also some gastric central reflexes. Uh, as you stretch the stomach, it is going to increase the activity of the intestine. It's going to move that chyme along. So if there's more food coming, your gut's going to respond and speed up the process. There's also a gastroenteric reflex. This is going to similarly stimulate intestinal motility and secretion along the entire small intestine. And there's also a gastroileal reflex. This is going to trigger the opening of the ileocecal valve. Once you have passed through the small intestine, going into the large intestine, there's going to be a reflex to open up that valve as well. So we have the central gastric reflexes, the gastroenteric, the gastroiliac reflex, and the ileocecal valve opening and response. The large intestine, also known as the, the bowel, this one you can simply go through and look at. You know that by now the uh, most of the nutrients have been absorbed. Now you're basically in the large intestine reabsorbing water and you're compacting the feces for removal. You're also um, absorbing vitamins that were generated by bacteria in your gut and you're going to be storing and packing those feces until they are defecated. There are three sections, if you will, of the large intestine. The cecum, the very beginning. The colon, now you know the colon can be further broken down into ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoidal. And then finally the rectum. So go through these regions. We have the cecum, off from which there's the appendix. Then the four parts of the colon, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoidal colon. Finally, to the straight region, uh, the rectum. This is an expandable temporary feces storage area that is now going to allow you uh, to store those feces, and then it's going to start pushing down on the, um, on the um, intestine, on the anal sphincters for defecation. Along the large intestine, there's also these fatty appendages. They're kind of these omental appendices. They're along the length of the um, large intestine. And there's the tenia coli, and these are bands of smooth muscle. They're running along the colon, and they're going to also help with pushing along the digestive products through the large intestine. The house jar are the little pouchy sections of the colon, and they're also helping to push things along and also allow for expansion, elongation of the colon as feces are passing through. So you're familiar with the cecum. Here's the ileocecal valve. Here's the cecum. There's the appendix. Up the ascending, across the transverse, down the descending, through the sigmoidal colon, and then into the rectum. Now, through the large intestine, there are mass movements, powerful peristaltic contractions. They're going to be happening each, every day, in response to distension of the stomach. So as you eat, or as food is going into your stomach or your duodenum, you're going to be having these powerful contractions through the large colon, and this is going to start pushing things and feces toward the anus. I'm going to stop there, and then on the next presentation that I'll try to get uh, recorded for you tomorrow or Wednesday at the latest, uh, it'll be the last presentation, and that will finish up on the digestive system and specifically talk about the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. So this lecture is coming in at just about an hour. The next one will probably be about the same length.